everyone. I'm violinist Stefan Jaquiv. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and I'm here with the Violin Channel. Big thanks to them for inviting me to do an Ask Me Anything, a VC AMA. So I'll be here for the next while, um, waiting for your questions and answering them as they come in. Um, so enter your questions um, on Facebook, um, and I'm excited to read them. Um, we've got one from Jackson um, through the Violin Channel who says, who would you most like to sit next to on a 10-hour flight and why? Um, I have to admit, I'm not someone who starts conversations um, when I'm sitting next to people on planes or trains. I'm pretty, I'm pretty introvert in that way. You should just like put on headphones and either listen to music um, or, or read something on my iPad or watch something um, on the plane TV. Um, but I enjoy talking to people whose lives are totally different from mine. I like hearing about, if they strike up conversation, I like hearing about why they're going, where they're going, what their life is like. Um, if they live in a country that I'm not familiar with, I'm really always interested in what their life is like, what their culture is like. So it's hard for me to pick a specific person who I would like to sit next to. Um, but I enjoy talking with people whose, whose, whose life experiences have been very different from mine um, because it's such a fascinating thing to learn about. Um, what's a good, Dimitri asks, also from the Violin Channel, what's a good habit that you'd like to start? Um, you know, I'll first tell you a little bit about the habits that I have that I think have been healthy for me. Um, I am quite a creature of routine. Um, I kind of do the same thing every morning when I wake up. I wake up around the same time, usually around like 8.30 in the morning without an alarm. Um, it's a small luxury in life, waking up without an alarm. Um, and then I have an espresso, um, and I kind of check the news, check my email, spend some time on social media, and then usually I start practicing at 10 a.m., and I kind of have like a 20-minute warm-up routine that's been a very helpful um, kind of habit for me to stick to. Um, I also really love running, um, and that's sort of a hobby and a habit, and that's something that I think has benefited me a lot. A, routine, a habit that I would like to adopt, um, which I've never tried before, but so many people swear by it, is meditation. Um, I would say I've been a little bit kind of lazy and not proactive enough to actually sit down and try to do it. It's supposed to be very difficult, especially right at the beginning. But it's something that I'm curious about, especially because people who stick to it religiously say that it's very centering, especially when you're nervous, which obviously as a performer is something that I grapple with. Um, so when I get around to it, maybe that'll be another habit that sticks. Um, another question, what three words best describe you? And this is from Jim. Um, Jim asks, what three words best describe me? Um, I would say that I am organized. I'm curious. Um, Organized, curious, and maybe disciplined. Um, those, I think curiosity is always a good thing. Discipline, we always think of as a good thing, but it's kind of, I was mentioning earlier, sort of that I'm a creature of habit, and I think that's a double-edged sword. It sort of kind of keeps you on a path that you kind of have set out on, but also there's the danger of it sort of boxing out other possibilities, and I try to let my curiosity temper that and not make me too kind of tunnel vision. But those are the three words I would pick. Um, Christian, live on Violin Channel Facebook, asks, are you interested in composing film scores? Um, you know, I am not a composer at all. Uh, I, that is just another realm of talent that I don't possess. Um, and, you know, as a performer, someone who create, who recreates or brings to life composer's works, I have the most respect and admiration for composers, and that is not something I think I can do, so you will not be seeing an original soundtrack by me anytime in the near future. Um, Joss Bell on Violin Channel Facebook asks, can you name two of your favorite living violinists from Europe? Um, yes, I, I tend not to think of violin, violinists as being, I, I tend not to divide them in my mind as, oh, these are violinists from Europe, these are violinists from North America, these are violinists from Asia, because A, I, I think that those divides aren't really that useful in the way I think about violinists, 
And also because so many people are so internationally, they may be born in one place and they move on to another con country or continent to study and then move yet somewhere else to kind of live and make a career. Um, but of course, there are many wonderful violinists who either are from Europe or currently live in Europe. Um, I mean, two heroes of mine from when I was probably in my college days up till now are um, the violinist Gidon Kramer and the violinist Christian Tetzloff. Um, I, they're, they're very different violinists, but I think they both sort of have, I don't want to speak for them, but kind of, I think they share similar, um, similar devotions to the score and to bringing the composer's um, intentions to the stage and sort of a kind of selflessness in their music making that I really love. Um, but they're, you know, I, I often think whenever, I, people often say, you know, we're, the, the golden age of violin playing was in the early half of the 20th century with, you know, Heifetz and Oistrock and all those people and Milstein. Of course, that was a golden age, but I really think we're in a golden age right now. There are so many amazing violinists from a variety of generations active today. Um, and the wonderful thing about the internet is even if they're not playing in your hometown, you can see them on YouTube or follow their social media. Um, so it, it's actually a really special, exciting time to be a lover of violin music and violin playing right now. Um, Jasmine asks, what school subjects did you like and hate most when you were in school? Um, I always really liked writing. Um, I, I've never done much writing outside of what was required of me in school. Um, but I always enjoyed writing and I think maybe it's sort of, maybe in my blood, my maternal grandfather, my mom's dad, um, was a writer, um, and he was sort of an early influence on me. I used to spend summers with him when I was very young, and he used to read to me a lot, and actually he's the one who kind of got me interested in classical music. So writing is something I've always really loved. I've also loved anything that has to do with the study of the human mind or emotions. I, I love learning about like what, what makes our brains tick, why we are the way we are, why we have the strengths and also the mental weaknesses that we have, um, how that sort of developed from childhood and how we sort of grapple with that in our, in our adult lives. Um, I actually started out, well, I didn't start out, uh, but one of my majors that I sadly abandoned um, as, a high, as a college student was in psychology, but that's something I'm still very interested in. As, as far as subjects that I didn't really enjoy, um, I'm not sure if my parents are watching this, but my, both my parents are theoretical physicists. Um, and I hated physics. I think, one, because I had no talent for it somehow, even though my parents, obviously, that's what they live and breathe. Two, because I think whenever I'd ask my dad for help on physics homework in high school, it always turned into kind of a, a tense situation because he would get frustrated that I was unable to grasp just elementary physics com uh, concepts and I would be frustrated at his frustration and it would always sort of like devolve into kind of us being sour at each other. Um, so physics is a, is a subject that I feel like I should have been, I don't know if I should have enjoyed, but I should have been good at, but I really didn't like um, and wasn't very good at. Um, the next two questions, uh, the first is from Mary who asks, do you enjoy teaching? I love teaching. Um, uh, teaching the vi violin, that is. Um, I I think probably I the the seed that started that kind of grew into this love of teaching was from my own violin teachers. Um, I was really lucky in that I studied with great violin teachers, um, great music teachers, um, who really instilled in me a curiosity and passion, both for sort of the craft of playing violin, but really for kind of figuring out how to interpret a piece in a way that's true to what the composer wanted, but also true to how the music speaks to me. Um, and in the past several years, I've been actually teaching increasingly. Um, I've got a small private studio here in New York City, a few violinists who play for me. Um, well, until March, it was in person, and now um, uh, virtually, of course. Um, and also, and this goes to our next question from Cole, uh, from, from Josie, sorry. Um, who asks, where did the ideas for Stefan's Sessions come from? Would you like to one day be a professor? Um, Stefan's Sessions is a project that I started um, about two and a half months ago. Um, and it's basically, 
An online gathering once a month on Zoom where I lead a deep dive into one masterpiece in the violin repertoire. So episode one of Stefan Sessions um, was in August and we focused on Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto and episode two was just a couple weeks ago we focused on Sibelius and episode three, little plug for Stefan Sessions, will be next month um, in October on, and we'll focus on Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto. And I think the most special part about it is in each session, I feature three or four outstanding young violinists, each playing sections from the concerto in question. Um, and I've received a lot of applicants for each session and it's been really inspiring to see just the excellence and the seriousness and the dedication and also the creativity of these young violinists submitting their, their um, videos on YouTube of them performing um, both the Mendelssohn and the Sibelius concertos. Um, it's something that I've really enjoyed. It kind of makes me think about these pieces in more depth. Um, you know, I've been playing these pieces for over a decade, but sort of like thinking about how I can express my thoughts in words to others kind of forces me to kind of maybe organize my thoughts in a more cohesive way. Um, and also I learn both from preparing for these sessions and also from responding to other violinists and how they play them. Um, I should mention that these sessions are both free to apply for and free to watch. They're on Zoom and um, it's kind of fun to have like a little community where we nerd out on, on one piece, one masterpiece in each session. Um, I also liked the idea of focusing on one piece per session because often in like a master class setting, you know, one person will play a little bit of this and the next person plays a little bit of another piece and it can be that it can be helpful but it's a little bit scattered whereas the idea of like today we're just going to focus on the Sibelius Violin Concerto and really get into like into that composer's world and what this piece is all about I thought would be um, helpful and also interesting um, and it has been so please check out Stefan Sessions. Um, Let's see. Uh, someone asks, could you please play your favorite three phrases from the entire repertoire? This is from, it's either Michael or Mishael on Violin Channel's Facebook, or other way around. Yeah, Violin Channel's Facebook. Three favorite uh, phrases. Well, I don't know if these are my absolute three at the exclusion of all others, but one that I love um, is the return of the main theme at the end of the first movement of the Beethoven's Violin Concerto. After an epic cadenza, we kind of end up where we started. So just sort of the idea of like we've come full circle and there's a very like prayerful quality to that. Another um, favorite phrase, um, this is from a piano trio that I've been playing quite a bit with my trio, the Junction Trio. Um, it's, it's both a phrase and also an entire movement because the movement is a theme in variations based on this phrase. Um, this is from the Slow Woman of Beethoven's Archduke Trio, Opus 97, um, and sort of right on the cusp between his middle period and his late period. And his late period is often thought of as kind of marked by a kind of contemplative um, kind of reckoning with um, kind of the universe or something. And there's sort of like a universality and sense of acceptance about... I, I realize that I've picked two pieces by Beethoven right now. Um, so for number three, um, you know, I, I have been thinking a lot about the Sibelius Violin Concerto. Um, so I would probably sit, pick something from there. Maybe the, maybe the opening of the third, of the second movement.
it's like the most glorious music ever. Um, someone asks, Abby C from my Facebook uh, fan page asks, how do you execute the perfect Boeing? Um, I wouldn't say that there is a perfect Boeing. I think really the music dictates what sort of Boeing you want. So for example, of those three phrases that I just played, in the first Beethoven one, at the end of the first movement of the Violin Concerto, we want a Boeing that kind of conveys a sort of like prayer-like vulnerability, intimacy, fragility. So we wouldn't want something too lush or it sort of like misses the point. So we want something delicate. Versus the opening of the Sibelius second one where you want something sort of kind of resonant and majestic. So there is no one perfect Boeing. You first have to decide what type of sound you want and then let the, tec let the technique follow the artistic or kind of sonic idea that you have in your head. There are certain principles that might help you like trying to make sure your bow is straight, making sure that you're not losing sound at the tip if you don't intend to. Um, but the general idea is to let technique follow intention rather than technique to dictate how it ends up sounding. Um, Conrad Tao via Instagram asks, does it hurt having to carry the Junction Trio through every gig? That's obviously a huge joke. Conrad is the pianist in the Junction Trio with myself and the cellist Jay Campbell. Um, Conrad and Jay are two musical geniuses and it is such a privilege and a joy and inspiration to play with them. Um, they carry me through every concert, so um, it does not hurt because I don't have to carry them. But I will say though that, um, you know, when I think about how I learn the most these days, you know, I'm, I, I can't remember the last time I took a lesson. Probably the last time I took a lesson was you know, over 10 years ago. So the, really the way I learn and improve and sort of expand my knowledge and is through chamber music and playing with other people um, like Conrad and Jay. And this, you know, can be little things like seeing how Jay uses his bow to produce a particular sound and me trying to emulate that. Or it can be very broad things like how they think about a specific composer, how they approach performing, what they feel their role as performer is. Um, so you know, now that concerts are sort of starting again a little bit maybe, it's I'm definitely playing more chamber music than concertos just because orchestral concerts are obviously more difficult to get off the ground um, during the pandemic. And so I've been meeting with my trio quite a bit and it's been it's been so fun and I just kind of feel that it's it's feeding it's feeding my musical soul playing with those two and others that I play chamber music with. Um, Jez asks, what are you most looking forward to post-COVID? Um, I'm looking forward to traveling, both for performances and also for pleasure. I'm looking forward to hanging out with friends indoors, like going over to like a friend's apartment and hanging out there. Um, I'm looking forward to eating inside, and of course I'm looking forward to performing for people. Um, I recently, last week, played my first socially distanced indoor concert uh, since March, and there were probably about 30 people in the audience in a, in a big church. Um, and it was, it was such like a, a welcome feeling, the idea of playing for someone rather than just for a camera or for nobody, um, kind of reminded, you, reminded me how important communication is in performance, how you're actually conveying something to a listener, and also, you know, I was talking with my trio the other day about how um, performance is sort of attending a concert is like it's quite a shared agreement among people like you know a couple thousand sometimes people come together into this big room and all agree okay we're gonna sit in silence while these few people on stage create sounds and we're all gonna sit there and sort of like appreciate these sounds in silence together and try to be moved by it and that's like almost sort of like a religious experience in some, in, in some comparisons. Um, and that sort of communal um, 
communal vulnerability, I think, is something that I, well, that you can take for granted when concerts are happening every week, but when it's gone, you miss it, and when you have it again, you're really appreciated. Um, Kate Hedin from Violent Channel Facebook. Little side note, Kate Hedin and I were in a string quartet together at summer camp, chamber music summer camp, probably in 2000, so about 20 years ago. So hi, Kate. Um, do you have a favorite genre or medium for playing classical music, as in solo, sonata, with piano, concertos, with orchestra, chamber music, etc., and why? I would say chamber music. Um, it's, you have your own voice, but at the same time, you're part of a larger conversation. So there isn't the loneliness of playing by yourself, and there isn't sort of like, the, the struggle to sort of be heard, which you can sometimes have when you play with an orchestra. There isn't this sense of like, um, which I try to avoid when playing with orchestra, of like soloist and accompaniment, because that, that, that doesn't feel spontaneous, doesn't feel like we're responding to each other. So the best chamber music experiences are where kind of we all are, are bouncing ideas off of each other in real time while playing and responding and being sensitive. And I try to make my concerto experiences have that same level of interplay. I think also, you know, it's, it's really fun to play music with people who you're friends with and who you have a personal relationship with um, because that, that added dimension of your relationship with them, I think, adds something to, to the performance for sure. Um, Carlos asks, what social media platform do you spend the most time on? I would say Instagram and YouTube. I did a lot of Facebook several years ago, but I kind of left Facebook a little bit. Um, and I was a pretty late adopter of Instagram. I think I resisted it for a while, just because as we all know that social media has both good aspects and sort of neg potentially negative aspects, and I kind of wanted to steer clear of them. But I'm back on, on social media, on Instagram. Shout out, follow me on Instagram. Um, and YouTube is just amazing. I mean, I just anything you could possibly be curious about has a channel on YouTube that has, you know, 100,000 followers and has vi new videos posted every day. So it's, it's really an amazing platform. I spend a lot of time on YouTube, whether it's like watching classical music or watching, you know, cooking videos. Well, I don't really watch cooking videos. I, I, I like watching videos about food, but not really cooking videos. Um, or just, you know, if you're interested in a city, you just look up that city in YouTube and you see someone, you know, live vlogging their like travels around the city. It's awesome. A um, few more questions. What do you do? This is from Aaron Kano or Aaron Kano. Um, what do you do in, in this 20 minute warm up that, that I was talking about? That's a really great question. Um, scales, arpeggios, and double stops. Um, I have found increasingly that scales are a chance for me to practice things that I wouldn't have the time, the luxury of time to practice when I'm practicing my, my repertoire that I'm preparing for performances. So, more specifically, I find that I do a lot of fast practice necessarily when I'm preparing repertoire because repertoire has a lot of fast music in it. But rarely do I practice repertoire at like really slow snail's pace. So I'll, I, I use the Carl Flesch scale book and on the first page of each new key there are um, scales in one octaves on each string and I practice them just like very slowly as if I'm just like finding my way making sure that I'm not like missing shifts and then adjusting but just like hitting them right from the beginning like if I'm playing um, a, D, a G major, uh, I'm sorry, an A major scale on the G string All these shifts are very slow So rather than repeating slight inaccuracies, I'm trying to do it just as perfectly as I can, no matter how slow a tempo it has to be. That's what I do for 20 minutes. Um, what are some, this is from Jillian. What are some words of wisdom from Mr. Weilerstein that has stuck with you all these years? Um, that's a great question. Mr. Weilerstein, of course, Donald Weilerstein, who was my teacher from my senior year of high school up until I graduated from college. So for about five years, I worked with him definitely had a huge effect on how I think about music, how I think about performing. You know, one key word that kept coming back in my lessons with him was vulnerability. And I think prior to studying with him, I focused a lot on, 
Well, also my teachers made me focus a lot on playing as perfectly as I could. No mistakes, dazzle the audience. And that kind of mindset inherently, I think, engenders a sort of like shieldedness. Like you don't want to show any weaknesses. You don't want to take any risks. You don't want to do anything that might kind of compromise the preparedness of what you've, what you've been practicing. And that also means that in performance, you kind of have the mindset of like replicating what you've done in the practice room. And Mr. Wilderstein was much more about like sort of like letting go of that sense of control and just sort of like letting yourself be vulnerable and um, kind of pulling off those layers of masks that we, that we sort of end up donning when we're trying to um, show our best self. Um, and that's something I still think about a lot. Like, you know, people don't come to concerts to see perfect technique. People don't come to concerts to see and to hear a note perfect performance of the Beethoven Wagenshire. They come to concerts to be moved. That's why I go to concerts. That's why I listen to music. I think that's why the vast majority of people love music. Um, and only if you let yourself kind of enter this vulnerable state, letting go of all sort of like preparedness and letting go of your own vanity. Um, and worrying about what your listeners will think of you, only then can you sort of like really capture something really true to yourself. I think that's a perfect place to end this little session. Um, it sort of got me thinking more about vulnerability. Um, I, it's something that I've car I carry with me every day. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to the Violin Channel for inviting me to, to do an AMA on their Facebook page. Um, follow me on social media. Look into Stefan's sessions. Hope you'll join and see you sometime soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you.